study the word of God, yes or no? Yes. All right, let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your mercy in all of our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the way the word of God speaks to us. And Lord, the way we see right here how you build your body through uh, chili competitions and rodeos and pontoon events and prayer meetings and great movies about spiritual warfare and just straight uh, Bible studies that the women and the men go through. And we're just so grateful to see your mercy and your grace and your power working in all of us. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the assignments that you're giving us and for the work that you have us doing together as a congregation, as a body. So, Lord, take our little study today and use it for your glory to build our lives stronger and stronger. In Jesus' powerful name. And everybody said, Amen. You know, I was uh, thinking earlier in the service about how I remember when I was a little boy, Mother's Day and Father's Day and events like that were always jam-packed days in churches. And as families have gotten tired or broken or weary and more and more people have broken hearts when, when moms think of their kids or the kids think of moms or the family dynamic or whatever, uh, a day like Mother's Day is harder and harder for some folks. And, uh, and I think that's sad. And I think we as a congregation need to really be devoted in protecting people's families and protecting people's homes and lives and relationships and things like that. It's just so, so very important because we want Mother's Day to be a celebration of giving life. And we want the integrity and the strength of a Father's Day to be there. I would imagine sometime in our lifetime, there'll be some bill in Congress that'll say Mother's Day and Father's Day are sexist, stereotypical roles, and it should all be undone. We should just have a family day. Or, but then they'll fight about that. So they'll eliminate the family day, saying that's an archaic institution and, and all that kind of thing. So I think, I think what we're doing is we're seeing a trend that, uh, that we really need to participate in. I'm, um, I do some premarital counseling, and it's so interesting when we get to the roles and functions that go on in, uh, in young people's families when they're trying to decide if they want traditional stereotypes in their family or if they want traditional roles in their family or how that will interface in their family. And it's a, it, from, from the early days when I would do premarital counseling, the discussion now is very, very different. And, um, and so on this Mother's Day, we want all of you moms to know that we deeply love and appreciate you. And we know there is a different role for moms than for dads. Sometimes it overlaps, granted. Sometimes it gets upside down, granted. But there's nothing like a mom. And dads aren't moms. And uh, yeah, some of the guys say amen to that. <laughs> the kids all say, oh, no kidding. Thank God for my mom, I'm alive. And so, 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 so the role that you mothers fill, even though our society is increasingly confused about it, I think it's irreplaceable. I think it is firm in nature and in, na as you know, nature's God's creation. I think it's very, very important that we maintain traditional families. I'm not saying that there's not gonna be social experimentation. There is. I'm not saying that we're superior to others. We're not, we're all saved by the cross and by Jesus. I am saying though, that over thousands of years, we've developed some systems that work very well. And all those systems that work very well have been abused and misused by some. We don't appreciate that. But boy, there is something beautiful and wonderful about a mom taking care of her kids, loving her husband, establishing a home, doing so many things in partnership and in fulfillment of the desires that this uh, woman and man had when they thought about what it would take to establish an environment where our kids can grow up healthy and 
and where, our, where we can sleep safe at night and where we can have a home and a family. Now, I know many of you are here, and that's broken down, and you've tried to reestablish it to some degree or another of success and things like that. But sometimes I think we have to get the clutter away and just look at foundational purposes of giving life and infusing guidance and loving unconditionally and intercessory prayer, which lots of, lots of moms are, are prayer warriors and feeling the great satisfaction of children being successful and respectful and personally feeling, I've noticed lots of moms, when their kids are great, they give the kids credit and when the kids start to mess up, they drape their bodies over the kitchen sink and say, where did I go wrong? And, and so it's this weird thing that goes on inside of a mom. Men never think like that. Men think if the kids screw up, it's, there, it's on them. But, but where moms take it very, very personally. And so I want to talk just a little bit this morning out of John, the third chapter. It's the account of Nicodemus and Jesus. And talk about Jesus' determination to be life-giving. And Jesus' determination even to nurture this guy and to encourage him. And all of us have this role. There are times when men and women alike have to mother somebody and parent somebody and uh, nurture somebody and strengthen somebody. So this chapter that is the scripture today in the Bible Highlights booklet highlights this idea of taking care of somebody else and trying to nurture them into the best possible place. This, many of you know this story. I'll read it right quick, and then we'll talk about it some. John, the third chapter, beginning with verse 1. Here the Bible says, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader, who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you, and that is true. The miraculous signs did validate who he was. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember, when he said that to him, everybody, he was talking to a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Let me describe to you just a little bit what this means. Okay, Nicodemus they, they, it, it is accepted by Bible scholars as being a wealthy man. It's because of what he did at the end of Jesus' life. Took a lot of money, and it's discussed in John 19 if you want to look at it. But he's a wealthy guy, so he's highly respected or powerful in the community. The Bible says he's a Pharisee. All right, now, I know we're, we look at a Pharisee from a Gentile New Testament point of view. So typically we look disparagingly on a Pharisee. Here's all a Pharisee is. A Pharisee is a person that says, I'm going to do what the word says. So actually a Pharisee would be very similar to the word of faith movement of today in that the word says that I'm going to do it. I believe the word and I'm going to do the word. We are doers of the word. All of those slogans fit perfectly into Phariseeism. All right. So all a Pharisee is, is a person that looked at the law, the Old Testament, what we would consider the word for the Old Testament. And they say, I'm going to obey the word. I'm a doer of the word. I practice the word of God. And so it messes us up when we try to read about the Pharisees in a negative light. Because that was not at all the condition of the day when these events were going on. These Pharisees were the guys that really worked hard at doing exactly what the Bible said do. Actually, they worked so hard at it that they added supplemental material to make sure they didn't even come close to a violation. All right? And they would monitor one another when they made a vow to obey the word. That this is a vow. This is a commitment. There's a limited number of people that would be accepted to make the vow. You have to make the vow in front of a group of people with witnesses that would validate that. And then you are committed to obey the word. Think of that. There's actually, that's a pretty good idea, don't you think? 
All right, on Mother's Day, don't all of you mothers wish that your children would read through the New Testament a few times and make a commitment to obey the word? You know, every, that's every mother's dream, every Christian mother's dream. And so I see Ashley over here thinking, they're going to do that, I can tell you. And so <laughs> these kids are going to obey the word or, okay, so... So, so this whole idea of being obedient, him being a Pharisee, so because he's a Pharisee, what that means is they're the best people in the community. Do all of you know that John Southers was on the longer list for consideration for FBI director? Did you hear about that? I'll tell you, when I heard that, I thought that would be the wisest choice they could make. He's out of the public eye. He's not a politician player. He's wise. He's a, I've known John Southers for 30 years. He is as steady as can be, as trustworthy as can be, as honest as can be. I mean, if there are, I don't know that there is any problem at the FBI, but if there are problems at the FBI, nobody would be better to clean that up than John Southers, in my view. Yeah. All right, so I heard that, but I know it's so political and so messy that I, don't, that I think they're going to uh, choose a more politically known person. But as I thought about this text, I thought, in my view, I trust John Southers. He's been our attorney general. He's our mayor now. You know all the contention we had in city government? And now it's kind of smoothed out. I don't, you may not like his decisions. You may not like him as well as I like him. But... Years ago, when New Life Church was about this size, John Southers was the prosecuting district attorney down here, and he came to New Life to speak. And you know what he said? He said, you all need to grow this church. Now, he's a Roman Catholic, all right? Bishop Hannafin was a bishop at the time. He said, you all need to grow this church, and here's why I say that. He says, in all my years as a district attorney, I don't think I've ever prosecuted somebody that was in church the Sunday before. So he said, you can change our city by growing this church to make it so the district attorney's office doesn't have so much work to do and make it so our police officers don't have so much work to do. If you'll get people committed to the Lord, then all of life is going to get better for our city. So we hit it. And we hit it. And so the years go, have gone by. We watch him. And we think this is a good man. All right, now, I'm not going to compare Nicodemus to John Southers and that you walk out of here and say, Haggard says Southers is a Pharisee. But <laughs> I, that is not what I'm saying. All right, I see you tweeting already. Stop it. Okay, so, so what, what, what I am saying, though, is there are men in a community or women in a community that you know are just good people. They're trustworthy, they're dependable, they're good people. They're people that make our city work. They're people that make our city better. They're people that make our cities safer. That's what Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was wealthy. He was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was part of the Sanhedrin, which, which is the Supreme Court. So it would be like him being on the Supreme Court. He's a religious leader. He's a good man trusted in the city. He comes from a wealthy family, so they have influence. All right. And, um, and he's distinguished. Um, secular records talk about a family that Bible scholars think matches the Nicodemus description from uh, the hundred years before Christ as a highly reputable, distinguished family that was doing wonderful things for the community and for the Jewish faith. And wanted to be obedient to God and those types of things. This Nicodemus is no slouch. All right. Nicodemus understood the things of the world. But Jesus wanted to talk with them about have, having authentic life. So I want you to see this as kind of a fourth dimension idea. Where here Nicodemus understood politics. He understood height, depth, width. He understood uh, the things of the day. He was thoughtful. He was educated. He loved to obey the word. This is an awesome guy. And Jesus wants to introduce him to this other world that's around all of us. And everybody, this is an important big idea that every one of us have to understand. The Robersons, two of them are in the building this morning that are committed to missions. Cal Zeb is committed to everything that's good. 
Okay, mom and dad are just elated that their children are turning out so well. All right, so, so we have this idea of a commitment to missions, commitment to the world, good people doing good things, but they're doing it because there's another world that we don't see. There's another world in addition to bank accounts. There's another world in, a different, in addition to us just wanting to obey the word and looking good. There's another world in addition to being good. There, and this other world is the spiritual world. It's a totally different world. And it's a parallel universe. Do you know what that means? That means it's here amongst us, but we don't see it. Sometimes we tap into it, but it's overlapped in our reality. So our reality is we drive cars and we go to the grocery store and we watch a TV show or go to a movie and we enjoy our friends and we pray and things like that. But when we pray, there's an impact that goes on in this alternate world, in this parallel universe that's all around us all the time. And so in this world that's all around us all the time, there are angels and there are demons. And the angels and demons minister to people. What that means is they influence people. They influence the way people think. They influence the way people's emotions go. They influence people's ideas. And so, so you have a human being standing here and we can see him. Okay, so all the parts are here. Here's hands, head, neck body, legs, feet, the parts are all here, but there's another, another series of entities all around. Since we're in church, a praying church and a godly church, a holiness church, and by holiness I mean we really appreciate the holiness Christ provides for us and infuses into us, we're a church that emphasizes that, and because of that emphasis, there's a lot of joy around here. People enjoy one another. We enjoy the kids. We enjoy these teenagers and young adults doing what they're doing. We enjoy chili suppers. We enjoy prayer meetings. We enjoy Bible studies. We enjoy, actually, we enjoy weddings and funerals. We enjoy, we're enjoying life. And it's because we're tapped into this other universe and we know this. All of us are living in, Paul calls these tents. Earthen vessels, temporary dwelling places, we know these aren't all life is about because of this other world around us that is a spirit world. Last week I was up in my office and I received a call, and uh, answer, the way I answer the phone is uh, St. James Church, this is Ted speaking. And the lady said, Father Ted, she said, Strange things are happening around our house, and we need a spiritist to come and see if it's my husband's dead dad. He thinks it's his dad coming around the house, you know, messing things up. Not, as I listened to her, I thought, could be. <laughs> and so, I'm kidding. For the, stop tweeting. All right. So, so... So she was describing, because this was his relationship with his dad, and his dad died, and this stuff started happening around the house. And so we would like to pay you to come to our house and pray through our house and tell us what we need to do to get rid of my husband's dad. <laughs> I'll tell you, pastoring this church has been an adventure and continues to be. All right, so we have a discussion with her, and we have this uh, process that we went through. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story, because it's off the point. I've already made my point. My point is, there's another world that's a parallel universe. Some people read it through eyes of reincarnation. And so, so some people think their golden retriever is their dead mother. And it, oh, so some people see this spiritual world because they know most people know that there's more than what we see. That there's a dynamic that goes on. And it's not just what you eat and what you save and how you invest and how you treat people. There's another dynamic that's real. And that's what Jesus was bringing Nicodemus into. Because Nicodemus had the foundational material to know. 
All right, so here he is, here he is uh, having this conversation, and he starts off with, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now, this word, born again, this phrase, born again, it's kind of the evangelical interpretation. In the Greek, the word, we, would, we, we could also use the word born anew. Born anew. Again, works. But my hesitation with born again is that it's become a slogan. What Billy Graham emphasized it hard, wrote books on being born again. Now secular people call us born againers. And so you go into a boot camp, they'll say, oh, he's a born againer. All right. And so, so that's become a phrase instead of a description. So this word that we translate again, now, born works, English and Greek. A new, though, or born again, the word again could mean three different things, which explains, <clears throat> explains, excuse me, I'm going, I'm 13. All right. It, which explains why Nicodemus misunderstood or why Nicodemus had a little bit of a limited understanding of what was going on here. Now, remember, it's Mother's Day. We're talking about giving life. All right. There are three English uh, angles we could work at with this idea of, again, the Greek word, again, we could actually, it would be better if we had three English words to talk about the nuances, but we don't, so we just use the word again or anew. The first is just start over completely from the beginning, a radically new thing. So you can say they're building the guitar Something's wrong with it. Throw it in the dump and start again with a new piece of wood. All right, so to, to start again, do it again, means ditch the old thing. Some of you have had cars that you just rode till their death. Couldn't get a cent for them. They're trash. All you're going to, the best you can do is get them hauled off. So you get them hauled off and then you get a, a, a new one again. All right, you get in again by getting a totally new one. Others, though, though, another meaning for this new is that it's for the second time. All right, so if you do it again, you're, it, run that race again, I think you can shave off a little time. Or, or uh, let, let's do that again. In other words, you're not dismissing what happened before. That was the first meaning. But you're doing it one more time. All right, so, so to do it one more time would be like having the old guitar and saying, I want to refurbish it. And I want to take what's there and I want to make it like new. And very often, if a, if a guitar or a car, some of, your, some of your cars, you get them, they're sitting in the barn for 30 years and you pull them out, you don't want to send it to the, to the junkyard. You want to restore this car. All right, so to make it new again, to make it born again. And actually, everybody, most restored airplanes and vehicles are better than they were brand new. All right, so the second meaning is kind of a restoration. So if we took an old guitar that was all beat up and we really did a good job restoring it, there would be some improvements on it, actually, as you restore it. And you try to make it as original as possible, but we make steel different now. We make tires different now. We make uh, all kinds of car parts differently now. So very often the restored vehicle is uh, better than it was when it first came off the line. That's the second meaning. So the first is completely get rid of the old and another and, and give us a new one. The second one is... Uh, let's, let's try this again. And, and that's what Nicodemus thought, by the way. And then the third is, um, if it's, again, it's something from above. It's a supernatural event. It's something from God. Okay, so when Jesus said, follow this, everybody. Are all of you getting bored? No. Okay, so when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you are born anew. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And I think he meant all three. I think, where Nicodemus thought he meant the second way. 
I think he meant, let's start this thing over. Let's take some pieces of it and make it a second time. And it's all from God. This is a supernatural event. And so here when he says that, Nicodemus responds with a second idea of doing the same thing a second time. He said, what do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus, how can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? So he's talking about a physical born again. He's not talking about a supernatural event. And he's not talking about getting rid of himself and coming back as a baby. All right. Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. In other words, born naturally and born supernaturally. We've got to be born of water. That's a common old phrase for things that are natural. And born of the spirit. That's God birthing us again. Humans can reproduce only human life. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. See, there it is again. The natural biological construction of a baby, of a human being, in, in, in addition to a spiritual construction of a new life from Christ. See, in the spiritual construction of a new life from Christ... He was saying, okay, so Nicodemus would believe because I'm biologically born Jewish and I obey the word and I'm a good man, I am assured eternal life. And Jesus was saying, you've got to have a spiritual birth. He, in other words, he was saying, there is an alternate parallel universe. There's another reality that is spiritual and you've got to have a birth in that you've got to have a reconstruction in that and it is a spiritual powerful experience now everybody let me put a parenthetical paragraph in here at this point this is why the devil does not want you to be a prayer person this is why the devil does not want you to engage spiritually so we can do everything we and this is not a put down of these things we can have chili suppers we can have pontoon rides. We can do all those things. And all those things are wonderful things. But they don't go to the core. When you go to the core, it's the Spirit of God being infused in the life of a human being to make a totally new creation under the power of God in the old car body. You see? So you have the old thing that is going to break and wear down and wear out and all those things. But there's this new life that stirs. And everybody, that's what the church, the church will use the things, a pontoon boat ride for the kids, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, whatever. We're using a movie. We use these things in order to stir this other spiritual world into you and me. All right, so what's the number one thing the devil can do to a Christian to keep them from activating this new life. Make sure they don't pray. And if they do pray, make sure it's boring so they don't connect. See? And so that's where the battlefield is. And this is, this, uh, as you women know, giving life is a war. There is a dynamic that goes on in, in the determination to raise a wholesome young man or a wholesome young woman. There's a battle that goes on. That's not just, that's not just for giggles. All right? And so as we go along, this spiritual life that infuses into young men and women and older men and women to let them see, what was this scripture for today? Let them see and think and act according to heaven. Yeah, hand it to me. According to heaven, not the earth. Exact wording. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. That's not saying be irresponsible about earthly things. That's saying let our focus, let our purpose be these heavenly things. Let, our, let this life of God be the purpose. And it's all shown us by a mother giving birth. There you have the biology of it. There you have some life and some ideas. But then as they grow, you infuse these ideas 
of the Spirit of God, the life of God. I mean, here we prayed over this baby this morning that there would be a stirring of the Spirit of God. So what we were saying was, God, we want you to take this alternate universe and plant it so deeply in this boy, he'll change a whole generation. See, we're praying over Anna. God, take your spirit and plant your spirit so deeply into Anna that she can go into Nepal and actually rescue people. Actually rescue people. We pray for Jess. As he goes through, he's here uh, getting oriented a little bit for his next task. And as he's doing that, that there would be such an infusion of the Spirit of God that it'll take all of Jess's other abilities. We won't throw them away. We'll take them all, submit them to the cross, and this other alternate universe comes into him, and, and he becomes a different man. Everybody, this is the most radical thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, that you can take a biological functioning being, put a different spirit in it, and it becomes a different being in that same body. That's what Jesus was talking about. And listen, everybody. We look around this room. This room is full of the living proof of how a life can dramatically change from just being an earthly life into being a heavenly uh, uh, infusion of God here into planet Earth. And see, that's what you are. That's what your charge is. And so here when he's describing it, he says, humans can reproduce, verse 6, only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. In other words, this Holy Spirit, this other world, it looks, it seems like chaos to us or, or a random thing to us. Just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from. In other words... <coughs> There are these natural things. The wind, we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going. They didn't even understand high pressure, low pressure things back then. They didn't understand any of that. All they knew was sometimes the wind blows hard. Sometimes it's not blowing at all. At all. It's a total mystery to us. They didn't understand it at all. And he used it as a picture of the Holy Spirit. And some of us may say, sometimes when I pray, I really engage. Other times when I pray, I don't engage so much. Then the devil will try to capitalize on that. Ah, oh, don't mess with it. Just say your prayer at, over your meal and that'll be enough. But then the Spirit of God is inside of you saying, oh no, engage me. Let me really do this work inside of you. And you may say, yeah, but my body's broken. It doesn't work right. Well, welcome, welcome. <laughs> All right. And so we've got these tents. Tents very often don't work very well. But the Spirit of God inside of us this is a powerhouse of life that the Spirit of the Lord wants to use in a powerful way. So Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, the expert, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now, everybody, this, these are the words of the Lord, and you and I are part of a movement that has thoroughly explained how people are born of the Spirit. When Jesus himself has said, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Kind of our theological deduction is if you say this Lordship prayer, then you are born again. Now, I don't know about you, but in my experience, I've known some people that have said the born again prayer and they couldn't be more full of the devil. And I know some other people that have never said the prayer the way I want them to by my training, who are wonderful ministers of the Spirit of God, life-giving and joyful. Because the issue is repentance and lordship. The issue isn't the specific words we say. So I've seen people, I, as you know, we used to give big altar calls and have sometimes hundreds of people coming forward. I'd recite a prayer with them and I could kind of watch I could see some people dramatically transformed other people have said the exact same words and it was just nice they did it because we were in church you know and we'd seen a nice play or whatever and and it was just kind of moving but you see this this is a mysterious thing about being authentically born again and it is so wonderful here God is saying you're not going to be able to teach this point by point in a classroom. 
you're not going to be able to explain it thoroughly. There is a mystery to authentic godliness that can only be discovered in the prayer closet or on the mountaintop or in some session that is somewhat disturbing where, you, where it dawns on you. Here I am, an earthly man or an earthly woman for you ladies. Okay, here I am, an earthly person. And the Spirit of God is working in me. The Spirit of God is speaking to me. The Spirit of God is saying things to me. He, the Spirit of God is molding me. The Spirit of and I don't know where this is coming from. I don't know where it's going to take me. I don't know what this is going to do in my life. All I know is that I'm possessed by a spirit and his name is holy. I'm transforming from the inside out the things I like to do. I don't like to do anymore. And some of the things I used to never want to do, I want to do now. There's a couple in this church that Gail and I love. We've known them for years. And, um, and now they... I'm telling this story because they're not here this morning, but the story contradicts what I'm about to say. Now they describe themselves as those people because they, they were, they're good Christian people that come to church on Sunday morning and have for decades. Okay, but now they come to the Wednesday night Bible study. Now they come to the... Uh, uh, Sunday night things that Aaron and the crew does. So there are those people that go to church three times a week. And, and they actually said to Gail, we've become those people. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're doing, we've become those people. Okay, everybody. Most people don't start off their life and say, you know, I really like going to church three times a week or however many times. All right. But as the Spirit of God starts to work in us, we start to, we start to see it, and we start to feel it, and we start to have that thing, this thing that Jesus was describing to Nicodemus. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. How is this possible? And Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. Now, here he's needling him a little bit. Now, here's what I think, guys. All of us need to know how to needle other people at the right time. I think that's a godly skill. All right, so here in verse 11, it says, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't, what Jesus is doing is, is explaining his authority. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things. No one has ever gone to heaven and returned. But the son of man, speaking of himself, has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And here it is, everybody. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. There is no judgment. Let's, let's look at this sentence. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. That sentence is the core of the gospel. You hear it? That sentence, John 3.16 is the most popular. But John 3.18 is a radically transforming verse. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world. But people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. 
But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. How many of you love doing what God wants? Yeah, because it's a beautiful flow of life. And here it comes to us by allowing the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, to dominate our lives. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful to be born again. We're so grateful that you got into our hearts and remade us from the very beginning. We became a brand new creation in you. But at the same time, you did it inside of these old earthen vessels. And so, Lord, the mystery of that is absolutely amazing to us. And we know that without a doubt, it's all a gift from God. So, Heavenly Father, every one of us during this Mother's Day, we celebrate the fact that we had moms and, and they did such a beautiful job of raising us and we bless them and we thank you for them. Lord, we thank you that when they gave us this body and when they nurtured and trained us, then you came with your Holy Spirit and infused us with new life to make us a brand new creation. So, Heavenly Father, on this Mother's Day, we celebrate life. We celebrate being nurtured. We celebrate being raised. We celebrate um, unconditional love. And, Lord, we give you glory. We know it's a gift. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus bless you all. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Go rejoicing.